Welcome to Exodus study number 37, chapter 21. We're going to jump in verse 12, go through verse 21. Exodus 21, 12 to 21. And we're going to start out with our Hibeli Hala, out to Brother Mark Easter. Now, Brother Mark doesn't get on the internet. Uh, he may not even ever see this. But if any of you know him, he's a local BBFer. And if you see this, you let him know that we sent him out a hillbilly holler. And uh, we just don't want to miss anybody. And uh, I don't know why. I, I guess because he's not on the Internet, it didn't cross our minds to go ahead and give him a holler anyway. So there you go, Brother Mark Easter. And uh, by the way, some of you know that uh, Mark and I and Brother Doug uh, went to visit his dad right before he passed away and his dad got saved. And so you might remember that, seeing that discussed in one of our past studies. I think we were, um, I think we were in Luke when that, we started Luke, or we, it's right before we started our study of the Gospel of Luke. So that's that. Wonderful memory. Great uh, answer to prayer. Brother Mark, just, uh, I know, is just blessed beyond measure, known as dads with the Lord. So, Let's uh, go ahead and start with a word of prayer and get into this Bible study. Father, we do thank you for all the souls saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And just like the thief on the cross, it's not a good thing to wait, but you will save those who will call on you, repenting toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in the shed blood and the finished work of the cross and the power of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. We thank you for all who have been saved. All that you've done in our lives, done for us over far and above and beyond anything we deserve. And we just do ask, though, we know you want us to learn your word, and we ask for your help as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, at this point in uh, our study of Exodus 21, this is as I mentioned, it's kind of a commentary on the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. And uh, at this point, we want to mention uh, something regarding what I call the one marriage onlyists. <laughs> uh, there are guys going around. There's whole cults and cultic groups who uh, just ignore dispensations, ignore context, and make a mess of things. And they run around acting like divorce is the unpardonable sin, or some of them act like remarriage is the unpardonable sin, and it's just hogwash. And right here in our previous study, and now as we continue, you can see that God does not share the hang-up that these people have over divorce and remarriage. Uh, God sanctifies marriage, and He has some rules for it, but not to the extent, extent that some of these crazy goofballs take it. So you know, notice how similar the passage we just studied, and if you didn't already, you should be going through these studies verse by verse with us, and don't skip any. And if you uh, haven't recently, uh, go back and do study number 36, you'll know what we're talking about. But 1 Corinthians 7 is the most hated passage in the Bible by these marriage only this one marriage only extremist verse 10 says and unto the married I command yet not I but the Lord let not the wife depart from her husband so that's the that's the rule that general rule that we shouldn't be separating and leaving our spouses if it can be helped but there's no period at the end of that verse Paul continues in verse 11 says but and if she depart. In this case, we're talking about the woman being married to an unbeliever. Or in this case, it just says just a wife who can't stay with her husband. It doesn't actually say it's, he's an unbeliever. He might just be an idiot or someone who is difficult to live with. He may be saved, but just not a good husband and is abusive possibly or, uh, you know, different things. But it says, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So you can separate, but you're not supposed to divorce in the circumstance being discussed here, which doesn't involve adultery. 
if you just live with somebody, you're married, and you just cannot live with them. There's something unbearable. You are allowed to separate, but you better be very careful. That's something that uh, women have taken advantage of when they know that it's okay to separate in, under difficult circumstances, but then they make things up. They lie, and they just want to try to uh, provoke their husbands to go off and divorce them and get another wife so they can move on. That's not the right way, not right reason or motive to do this. You should do this if you think you're, you're, you or your children are in danger or um, it's just impossible for you to live in that situation. You can, you separate with the desire to reconcile. Verse 12 says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. What he means is, uh, this is not something Jesus said or is recorded saying in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or Acts before he ascended. But this is the word of God. Some people try to say, see, Paul's saying it's not the Lord's word, it's just his opinion. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying that you won't find this spoken by Jesus, but through me, this is just as much uh, the word of God as anything else you read in the Bible. So don't let people talk you out of believing what you're reading here because of that phrase. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And I'm asked from time to time if, you, if I'm unequally yoked. Yeah, if you were saved and you married someone who's unsaved, you, that was wrong. It's a sin. Be, uh, 2 Corinthians 6 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But once you're married you don't depart just because they're unsaved. You knew that going in, and so you should stay married to them. But if the unbeliever departs, it says, uh, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So don't divorce because you're unequally yoked. That's not right. It's unbiblical. But then verse 13, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So Paul's making it clear. You don't divorce people because they're unsaved. If you were unsaved when you got married and then you got saved, they're still not unsaved. You still are not supposed to divorce and move on. Uh, if you married unequally yoked, you knew you were getting into this, and it's not a reason or it's biblically unwarranted to divorce. And he goes on to say in verses 14 and 15, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. That doesn't mean they're saved because they're married to a saved person. Sanctified means set apart. It means your marriage is set apart in God's eyes. It's legit. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So there's nothing, and there's people who have tried to teach that if un unequally yoked people have children, that somehow their children, if they die before, before they get saved, they say they die as infants, they'll go to hell. Nonsense. So verse 15 then says, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Now that's what flies in the face of these one marriage onlyist extremists that say, No, never, never, ever. Uh, uh, Paul says, verse 15, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace, and it's clear from the context when it says depart, it means they're, they're totally leaving the marriage. It would involve, in America today, it would invo involve divorce through the courts. Now, not in, in every culture, it's not like that. So the Bible has to be understood in its context, but how it relates to your culture according to when you're alive and what government you're under. In our country, that would mean this guy's going to leave and get a divorce and move on to another woman. And the Bible says you're under no bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, when Jesus taught on the matter of divorce and remarriage, it was in the context of personal reflection, or uh, um, you, you need to look in at yourself. Paul is dealing with basically what we would call legal matters the legal uh, status of the relationship. Jesus, in Matthew 5, he's talking about you looking at yourself. And it says uh, in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, and you'll see this isn't about legal application, about divorce and remarriage. It's about you and your heart and your personal condition. 
Matthew 5.31 says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verse 32, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now that's not in a legal sense. That's in a practical sense. It means that if, if I were to divorce my wife without biblical grounds, I'm putting her in a situation where if she remarries, I am responsible for the fact that she is in a situation that is technically the same as adultery because our divorce was not legit. But look who the onus is on. It's not saying that the wife is condemned. And it's not saying that the person the wife marries is condemned. It's talking about the person who divorces, that the person divorcing causes the sin. And that's the point. The point is Jesus is telling people, if you divorce without biblical grounds, you are going to be held accountable for the fact that you are putting your spouse, who will then become your ex-spouse, in a situation like that. If you go back, we don't have time to run all the references on this, but if you go back in Deuteronomy, the Bible says that if a man divorces a woman and she remarries, that she's now that man's husband, she is no longer your husband, and if she divorces again, you cannot go back and take her again as your wife. God considered that unclean. But at no point in Deuteronomy does it say that the woman who has been divorced and moves on and is remarried has done anything wrong. And that's what Jesus is saying. She's not, it's not her that did the wrong. It's the man who caused the wrong who's going to be held responsible. And this isn't a legal thing. This is a personal thing. It's to wake you up men and wake you up women to the reality of the repercussions of your choices um, these Pharisees who run around trying to say that if you're married uh, and then you get a divorce and or in my case uh, I was divorced the, uh, the woman I married my first wife without biblical grounds sought a divorce so she could move on with her life she was she wanted to live outside of relationship with the Lord and so forth. She ended up after divorcing me, um, remarrying. She was responsible for that because I didn't get the divorce and there's nothing I could do to stop it legally. And then she passed away and will answer for all that it's between her and the Lord. But as far as I'm concerned, I did what I was supposed to do. I fought the divorce. I won the custody of my children. And then after we divorced, then I was free. I was, according to 1 Corinthians 7, um, I'm under no bondage. So I move on and I find this lady who is a wonderful Christian and a widow. And so we marry. And then because I've been divorced and remarried, then I hear this stuff. And none of these guys who come after me ever tell you that in the same context of the verses, five, uh, Matthew 5, 31, 32, that Jesus also said, ye have heard it, this is verses 27, 28, just above, same context. Ye have heard it, that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Again, Jesus isn't dealing with legal issues, he's dealing with the heart. If that, if this context is supposed to be dealing with legal issues, and whether or not you're, you're committing some kind of a sin by going on and getting remarried or whatever, then according to this, every man I know is disqualified from ever getting married. They've committed adultery as teenagers or in their early 20s before they get married. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not teaching this for that purpose. He's teaching for me to reflect on me. Not for you to run around telling everybody, you can't get divorced and remarried. You, 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 you've disqualified, for, you've sinned. You, you know, that's not what the point is. And even another example is in the next two verses, 29 and 30. Matthew 5 says, and if they, thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. None of these Pharisees have missing eyeballs. None of them. And you can't tell me that none of these people using this text in this context to condemn divorced and remarried people who were 
either got a divorce on biblical grounds or were div divorced by their spouse on unbiblical grounds out of their control. And then they go on and remarry. None of those people condemning us have missing eyes. And you can't tell me none of those people have ever looked on something to lust or covet. They should all be eyeballless. <laughs> they should all have empty eye sockets if they're, they're, I'll tell you why they don't. They're hypocrites and liars, just like the Pharisees. That's why I call them that. Uh, it says uh, that in verse 30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is prof. Um, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. None of these people who condemn married and remarried people or married, divorced and remarried people, none of those people are missing a right hand. None of them. And if they are, they were probably in the war. It's not because they're following Matthew 5. So, I just want to point that out. The cherry picking that goes on with the scripture with these people who are just dishonest. So we pick up in verse 12 and we'll point this out from time to time as we go on. But verse 12 then moves us into a different area and says, you know, we read in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Well, here's some commentary on that. Verse 12 says, he that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. Now, there's a period there, but we have to take all the counsel of God. So, some will quote this and ignore what's coming after. And they'll say that if you kill anybody, you die. And they'll say, that's why the death penalty is so wrong. Even though we're told in Genesis, I think we have the references, we'll go over them later, but in Genesis, before the Mosaic Law, Romans 13, after the Mosaic Law, during this dispensation, we're told that if a man kills another man, that he should be put to death. And they ignore all these other passages and take this one verse, he that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. And they say that because of that, you should never go to war, you should be a pacifist, you shouldn't use deadly force to defend yourself and your family, and there should be no capital punishment, and on and on. It's hogwash, they just totally abuse the Bible. And if we ignore the context and stop reading, then we'd join the pacifists and we'd never, we'd be against war even for self-defense. Now, I'm not for all wars. I've had problems with, you know, the, the way the war on terror, I think, has been a horrendous uh, mistake. And uh, they should have just gone into Afghanistan and killed the people responsible for 9-11. But I believe there were also people here in America and Saudi Arabia who were responsible that have never come to justice either. That's uh, different for another time. But pacifism is as anti-biblical and heretical as is the false teaching that we just talked about when it comes to divorce and remarriage. And pacifism is a deadly heresy. So let's allow the whole counsel of God to speak by continuing in verse 13. And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. So if it's not premeditated murder, God had a setup where you could run to a city of refuge. And then there would be a, basically an investigation and trial as to whether or not you did it uh, on purpose, if it's premeditated, or if it was an accidental death, or you were just defending yourself. In those cases, you, you would be let free, or you might have to offer a sacrifice, and what, you know it gets more detail later on in, uh, I believe in Leviticus and Numbers. But right here, it just basically just says what we just read, that if you didn't premeditate, purposely kill the guy, then uh, there will be cities where you can run and have protection. And then verse 14 says, but if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor, now we're talking premeditated murder, it says, to slay him with guile, there's motive. Thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. In other words, you could run to a ref city of refuge and uh, you're still going to die um, because you're guilty of premeditated murder. And uh, there is one particular uh, story that comes to mind 
I'm going to try to find it here real quick, is in uh, the story of, uh, is when Solomon was king. And Adonijah uh, feared because of Solomon when Solomon became king. And in 1 Corinthians 1, 51, And it was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah feareth King Solomon, for lo, he hath caught hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear unto me today that he will not slay me, uh, he will not slay his servant with the sword. And um, in that case, he let him live. Uh, for a while. But he said, If he shall show himself a worthy man, there shall not a hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. And then, in a, I think it's just the next chapter. Yeah, First Corinthians, uh, First Kings 2. Um, Joab fled unto the Lord and caught hold on the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon that Joab was fled under the tabernacle, and behold, he is by the altar. Then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go, fall upon him. So there's a couple of examples where men ran to refuge, and the refuge was denied them because, in the second case, in Joab's case, because he was guilty. Uh, but at least you had a fighting chance. <laughs> you had an opportunity to prove yourself uh, innocent or at least not guilty of premeditated murder uh, under the system that the Lord set up. And again, this sounds strange to us. We don't run to a ref city of refuge. We run to a lawyer. But in this time, this is very radical. It's very um, uh, unprecedented human rights protections. And you have to appreciate that in order to understand how amazing this was. So now we move on to the next three verses, and we get some more information on what kind of crimes would result in a death penalty. Uh, Exodus 21, 15, And he that smiteth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Now, I'm not under the law. We're not under the law now, but when I was a kid, I was pretty wild, and there were a couple of times where I got in a scuffle with my uh, dad, and I'm thankful that even though I didn't think of the Scriptures or anything like that, something held me back from trying to hit him or anything but um, I've heard a couple of cases where um, guys hit their father and it wasn't in self-defense it was just a scrap and those guys just so happens it didn't end well for them in life and uh, it's just something for the young people to be taught and think about and verse 16 continues and says and he that stilleth a man and selleth him or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So, uh, domestic violence against parents and kidnapping, or what today is called human trafficking. Um, and then verse 17 says, And he that curseth, curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So, cursing your parents as well. Those are all reasons under the Mosaic Law for the death penalty. Now, obviously... That's an area where we don't do that today. Um, and some people are quick to say, well, I think we ought to. Yeah, well, that'd be different if you, if you were a parent and you had children. And um, now when it comes to kidnapping, there's, you know, if, if somebody's trying to leave and you shut the door and won't let them leave, right there, you're considered to be committing that crime. And so <laughs> it's a good thing. Uh, the kidnapping in, see, in this case, we, you know, they didn't have the silliness. They didn't have the litig litigations uh, and uh, lawsuits that, you know, civil suits and all that. So you, you had to really be trying to steal somebody from their family and take them away or sell them into slavery. But today, it's been expanded to the point where just keeping somebody from leaving. And uh, you, they try to make a phone call, and you pull the cord out of the wall or something like that. And uh, people got in real trouble for that. But thankfully, we don't kill people for that. But that's an explanation of thou shalt not kill. But the Bible clearly says you can defend yourself, and there is capital punishment. 
And so anybody, any anytime you hear the Pope or somebody like that saying, well, we shouldn't kill because the Bible says thou shalt not kill. Well, the Bible says in addition to that, there are times where justifiable homicide, capital punishment is um, biblical. And you note that um, all of these are to be law um, when it comes to the general idea of capital punishment, for example. It predates Mosaic law. I mentioned before Genesis 9, 4 to 6, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. You got this perverted thing. People say, well, you're cheapening life by killing. No, it's the fact that that man took a life. And because we, we, have, we believe in the sanctity of life, that we are not going to allow people to take lives without them losing their lives. And if you don't understand that, and all these people, they're all, they always talk about love, peace, and we're against capital punishment. They're perverted. They're a bunch of perverts. They've completely perverted love and justice and peace. Because the Bible says, because we should love our brother, love our neighbor, respect one another, then if we kill our neighbor, and it's not self-defense, justifiable homicide, well, then you die. In Romans 13, 3 to 5, continues, says, uh, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a, the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. 1 John 5.16 also says, If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So there's sin, and there's debate on exactly what that means, but I believe it just means what it says. Uh, a sin unto death uh, it is, uh, could be suicide. That's one of the views. Uh, but it, it says there is a sin which is not unto death. And uh, he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. But it says there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. Regardless of how you take that verse, it does teach the principle that God believes there are some things that people should die for doing. And so capital punishment is biblical. And we're uh, going to run out of time before we get through to 21. But uh, just real quick. Uh, verse 18 says, And if men strive together, and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed. Verse 19, If he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time, and shall cause him to be uh, thoroughly healed. So these are specifications on simple battery, assault and battery cases, and they do not warrant death. And some, it's important, because in some countries, They'll kill you just for assault if you hit somebody or something. So punishment for violent crime that doesn't result in death, it does include penalties like covering lost wages, what we today say health care costs, legal fees, pain and suffering, and that sort of thing. But you don't kill people.